People across Latin America are standing up against social inequality. In several countries, organizations demand justice and solutions to the economic and social crisis. On an official visit to Venezuela, the Secretary General of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, Mohamed Barquindo, praised the country's central role in the organization. A month since the Taliban seized power in Afghanistan, social and economic uncertainty reigns in the impoverished nation. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South and I'm Katrina Goss. We start with details regarding several mobilizations in different Latin American countries, in some cases coinciding with the bicentenary of their independence. In Ecuador, roadblocks and protests against the government of Guillermo Lasso took place this Wednesday throughout the country. In the context of this national strike, transport workers cut off the main highways, while the agriculture sector has declared itself in an emergency. The student movement is also protesting against budget cuts and attempts to privatise educational institutions as the latest policies of the Lasso administration. Since Lasso took office on May 24, fuel prices have risen as continuity of the neoliberal policies implemented by former President Lenin Moreno. Those Ecuadorians mobilizing denounced that Lasso has failed to fulfill his campaign promises. Protests are also taking place in Uruguay, called by the main trade union of the country. The 24-hour strike action demands improvements to social policy and rejects the law of urgent consideration proposed by the government of Luis Lacapu. Rural workers, small-scale farmers, the network of community kitchens, students, representatives of the cultural and sports sectors and the trade union movement as a whole are present as part of the mobilizations. Bank and transportation workers have also joined the protests. Among the demands of an increase in the education budget, ensuring school children are fed through school canteens and wage rises for teachers. Thousands of Salvadorans marched through the streets of San Salvador on Wednesday to protest against government policy. The mobilizations take place in the framework of the commemoration of 200 years of independence. The entry into force of the Bitcoin law, the endorsement of the Constitutional Chamber for presidential re-election and reform of the judicial career law are some of the most recent measures that have sparked condemnation among the population. Rallies began early at the University of El Salvador, where students, environmentalists and indigenous people gathered, joined by the feminist movement. President of Bolivia, Luis Arce, headed a meeting with indigenous representatives in the northeastern department of Beni this Wednesday, who presented proposals for local development to the national government. During the meeting, attended by over 500 representatives of different grassroots organizations, President Arce stressed the importance of providing the necessary support to the country's indigenous peoples with full inclusion and recognition in all governmental policy. He also highlighted the planned programs and productive projects in the area. Arce called for unity among indigenous peoples and warned of right-wing attempts to sow division. He also recognized the role of indigenous peoples in the recovery of Bolivia's democracy following the 2019 coup. Similar events were previously held with indigenous communities in Santa Cruz, La Paz and Tarija. We were pushing for the plurinational state where it is recognized, where we looked at ourselves in the mirror, brothers, and said there we are. We had been indigenous, we had had indigenous roots, and the national government is now coming to tell you, my brothers, you indigenous peoples of Beni, you are not alone. Here is your national government that will help you, brothers. And leader of the Center of Indigenous Peoples of Beni, Guillermo Suarez, expressed satisfaction with the meeting held by President Luis Arce, assuring that it will serve to address local demands. It is the opportunity to be able to talk about our needs from the root of the problem, to undermine this possible march that is being made. People who have no organization, who have no relationship with the basis, people who no longer have the spirit of struggle, they do not have to talk to the basis. They are people who only obey patterns in a political issue. So we are presenting our real needs to the president. He is opening a space for us to dialogue with the indigenous people. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away.
Welcome back to From the South. On an official visit to Venezuela, the Secretary General of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, Mohamed Barquindo, said Venezuela has played a crucial role in the organization's formation and subsequent successes throughout its history. The comments came as OPEC celebrated its 61st anniversary on Tuesday. Venezuela was one of the five founders of the bloc back in 1960 in a move that sought to coordinate the petroleum policies of its member countries and ensure the stabilization of oil markets. As part of the visit, Barquindo met with the Venezuelan Minister of Industry and National Production, Tarek El Asami. The OPEC Secretary General expressed his sincere gratitude to the Venezuelan government for its contributions to the organization, highlighting its active role in OPEC's responses to the oil market downturn of 2014 to 2016 and the severe oil demand contraction due to the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. Meanwhile, El Asami reiterated that despite the United States' unilateral and coercive measures, Venezuela remains committed to OPEC and its member states. I take the liberty of denouncing on this occasion, in spite of the efforts made by the organization, to ensure the stabilization of the world oil market, that Venezuela is still subject to an illegal and implacable siege by U.S. imperialism and its allied governments, with the intent purpose of taking ownership of the world's largest oil reserves, as evidenced by the coercive measures imposed on our oil industry. OPEC Secretary General Mohamed Barkindo said member countries will continue to work together to address challenges. So, Mr. Minister, we at OPEC, with all the members, including Venezuela and other energy producing countries, will continue to form a coalition in order to address these two challenges. Mohamed Barkindo also urged OPEC member countries to continue working to strengthen the organization. We thank God because he has allowed us to overcome this crisis of 2020 and we have been able to begin the recovery of the world economy and I would like to call on you but also on the entire OPEC team to continue working as a team to strengthen the performance of the organization. A Guatemalan special court issued the first conviction against one of 22 teachers and workers of the Ministry of Education accused of the sexual abuse of an equal number of girls in recent years in the north of the country. The historic sentence of 27 years in prison for the crimes of rape and sexual assault was handed down to teacher Armando Filiberto Vaides Juarez for having sexually abused an indigenous girl when she was aged between 12 and 14 years old. Vades Juarez is the first of 22 public system teachers accused of sexual abuse of 22 indigenous girls, all of whom are represented by a special human rights law firm which adopts a feminist approach. Their lawyer stressed that the conviction represented hope for the victims and that schools should be a safe space for all children. Today, the professor was sentenced to 27 years and 8 months for rape and sexual assault, using all his knowledge, his strength, and above all, the knowledge he had at the scene over the 12-year-old victim. The defense used gender bias and stereotypes and attacked the victim directly, saying she was responsible for not paying attention and not his sponsor for raping a 12-year-old girl. For us, it is a celebration because it means that we can bring a message of hope to the girls of Alta Verapaz. There is justice, love, hope, that life can be revealed. Today, for us, is the first sentence. For the human rights law firm, this is a turning point. But none of this would have been possible without the support, love, dedication, and commitment. First, from the victims. Second, from the community of La Esperanza. And third, from a team that has not slept. We have not eaten. And here we are, because our driving force is to tell the girls of this country that we have the right to live a life free of violence. Thank you. Also in Guatemala, there was a registered increase of 31% in femicides between January and August 2021, compared to the same period in 2020, according to a report launched by the NGO Grupo de Apoyo Mutuo. The NGO detailed that in the first eight months of this year, 396 women and girls have been murdered in Guatemala. The director of the organization noted that in August alone, 43 femicides were registered. The official emphasized the scarce attention paid by authorities to threats and intimidation against women and stressed that lockdowns due to COVID-19 have made women and girls even more vulnerable to male violence.
On Tuesday, members of the Chilean Constitutional Convention celebrated the approval of several fundamental texts as part of the process to rewrite the country's constitution, which dates back to the Pinochet dictatorship. Convention members approved regulations on ethics, indigenous participation and consultation, human rights, as well as the general regulations for the process. Prior to these votes, the type of quorum that should be applicable for the approval of each article was discussed. The president of the Constitutional Convention, Mapuche indigenous rights activist Elisa Loncon, expressed her satisfaction on securing the approval of the basic working rules and the definition of the quorums and votes necessary for the adoption of articles of the new constitution, as well as the internal texts of the convention. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. This Wednesday, September 15th, marks one month since the Taliban seized power in Afghanistan. A lot has changed since the Taliban returned to power after 20 years of war and occupation and the final withdrawal of US and NATO troops. The Afghan economy is in ruins, despite hundreds of billions of dollars supposedly invested in development over the past two decades. According to the United Nations, the situation threatens to plunge 97% of the population into poverty by mid-2022. On top of this, the humanitarian crisis due to the displacement of millions of people, thanks to the conflict, continues. As the international community pledges aid and calls for a more progressive Taliban government, the nations responsible for the crisis refuse to assume their historic responsibility. Lebanon's new cabinet is committed to resuming talks with the International Monetary Fund for a short and medium term rescue program. Prime Minister Najib Mirkati's government is due to meet on Thursday to approve the draft deal, which will then go to a vote of confidence in Parliament. The new government, which was finally installed after a year of political instability and disputes over cabinet seats, is faced with one of the worst economic crises in recent history. The draft policy statement said that President Michel Aoun's administration would begin implementing reforms as it resumes talks with the IMF, which broke down last summer. Negotiations will restart with creditors to reach an agreement on a mechanism to restructure the public debt and put in place a plan to reform the banking sector. Neoliberal reforms that are unlikely to benefit the majority of the population or respond to their urgent socio-economic needs. The tensions on the Korean Peninsula are escalating after Fongyang test-fired two ballistic missiles, Seoul, in apparent response, launched a ballistic missile from a submarine. With South Korea's successful submarine launch, the nation became the seventh country in the world with the advanced technology, raising the prospect of a regional arms race. The test, supervised by President Moon Jae-in, came hours after the Democratic People's Republic of Korea conducted its tests and as China's foreign minister visited Seoul. South Korean authorities said the missile was fired underwater from its newly commissioned submarine and flew the planned distance before hitting its target. On Wednesday, China concluded the first multinational peacekeeping exercise on its territory, dubbed Shared Destiny 2021. Troops from Thailand, Mongolia and Pakistan joined China's armed forces for the 10-day exercise at a military base in Keshan County in central Henan province. The exercises included a close to real battlefield environment set in accordance with international standards. Chinese military sources said they would continue to take a more active role in UN peacekeeping operations as a staunch defender of world peace. A small cargo plane with three crew members on board crashed into a mountain in Indonesia's jungle-clad Papua region on Wednesday. Police and transport officials said the Ribbon Air flight lost contact with air control authorities shortly before it was due to land. The wreckage of the aircraft was found by locals over three hours later near a village in the highlands. Indonesia's fast-growing aviation sector has long been marred by safety concerns, with its airlines once banned from US and European airspace.
As informed by our operation division, we have established a joint team with the police and the military to perform trekking or reaching the site via land to try to evacuate the crews. We hope everything can go well and safely. It's been one month since the earthquake that hit Haiti and left more than 2,000 people dead. Our correspondent Daisy Toussaint brings us more details on the recovery efforts. Just a month ago, a 7.2 magnitude earthquake on the richer scale shook southwestern Haiti, bringing the terror back to a nation historically battered by such events. The house fell down completely. When I arrived home, I had no place to sleep because the house had already fallen down. Aid arrived from countries such as Venezuela, Mexico, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, among other nations. But the lack of support from the local government and the indifference on certain international organizations have been felt, as the people try to survive in the midst of the chaos. I went to the father's house for the baptism. At 7.30, we went out to the street and the earthquake happened. When we were in the middle of the street and my wife died and I was under the wall at the same time. I don't have anything in my upper body, but my waist is destroyed. I broke my leg and left seven children outside. My house fell down. That earthquake was not an isolated misfortune. Large demonstrations, the impunity of armed gangs that terrorized the population, the assassination of the president, hurricanes, epidemics, all happened one after the other in this country. I am 17 years old. That's my baby girl. In the earthquake, the house fell on top of us, and they pulled her out from under the debris, and we came here with the baby. Now we have to go home, but because of the rain, we can't go out, because there is a lot of rain, and we can't go out to where we used to live. An earthquake that resulted in more than 2,000 fatalities, injuries, destroyed homes, and the arrival of a storm that aggravated the critical situation. When we arrived at the house, we found the house on the ground, the whole house on the ground. After that, the neighbors pulled our boy out. It was the neighbors who pulled our boy out from under the house and took him to the Cora Pima hospital, and then put him in an ambulance and brought him here. And now he is getting better. Look at his head. It was a rock that fell on his head, and now there is no house. Underneath the rubble, pain, death, and desolation lie dormant. If we turn our eyes towards this striking nation once again, we see that the houses that collapse lie in the same place, in pieces, while their inhabitants mourn not only the physical wounds caused by the collapse, but also those of the soul for the loss of their loved ones. Para Telesur, Daisy Toussaint. The wildfires in the U.S. state of California are threatening its famous gigantic trees. Sequoia National Park was shut down as its namesake gigantic trees were potentially threatened on Tuesday by two forest fires burning in steep and dangerous terrain in California's Sierra Nevada. Both fires were projected to advance in the direction of Giant Forest, which is home to more than 2,000 giant sequoias, including the General Sherman tree, the largest on earth by volume. Park authorities said the closest flames were about 1.6 kilometers from the grove, adding that 75 people were evacuated. The Colony and Paradise fires, named for the locations where they started, were ignited by lightning last week. Their combined sizes grew to more than 12 square, square kilometers. During his visit to the National Renewable Energy Lab in the state of Colorado, President Joe Biden called for investment to tackle the impact of climate change and extreme weather events in the United States. Extreme weather, as we're seeing, is only going to come more frequently and with more ferocity. And we're blinking code red as a nation, and we really are. The only debate is around what we do to confront this crisis, and that shouldn't even be a debate. You know, we have to invest in being more resilient uh, because of the impacts of climate. The climate change is current today, not next year, not 10 years from now. <clears throat> we have to make the investments that are going to slow our contributions to climate change today, not tomorrow. 
And here's the good news. <clears throat> Something that is caused by humans can be solved by humans. And we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching. <laughs>